Okay, are we, are we good to go yet? <laughs> oh, all right, okay. <laughs> Hi, my name is Chillin, and I am a victim of Joy-Con Drift. It all started when I bought my bright blue pair of Joy-Cons. I probably enjoyed them for a couple of months or so, and uh, then, well, uh, then it happened. Long story short, I tried putting my Joy-Cons back on my shelf. They fell, and uh, it was never the same. Not long after the incident, one of my previous Joy-Cons started to drift as well, so I just took one Joy-Con from each pair to make a full functional pair, and uh, it's just so terrible. I mean, these things are not cheap. Millions of people are affected by this, and I'm sure if you asked anyone out there what their thoughts were on these things, it wouldn't be pretty. What are your thoughts on the Nintendo Switch Joy-Cons? Um, they're, they're okay. What are your thoughts on the Nintendo Switch Joy-Cons? The what? The joy, Joy-Cons. The Toy-Cons? Jo joy, Joy. No, Toy-Cons? The ones with the Nintendo Flip? Like you flip them on their side? Dude, they're, they're great. What are your thoughts on the Nintendo Switch Joy-Cons? What, what are you doing in my house? Who are you? At the end of the day, Joy-Cons should do what they do best than just drift out of existence. I know that can be a little harsh, but I, uh, I, I don't really care for these. The Joy-Cons. Only half of that name is right. It's the Nintendo Switch's main way of control. You can slide them in a grip, keep them spread apart, click them on the console, switch them to carpal tunnel mode. Dude, these things have it all. I can't deny the amount of versatility these bad boys have. They're pretty interesting controllers. And Nintendo isn't really known for having the most normal controllers at times. You have some ranging from the holy grail to the more controversial. When it comes to Nintendo's current gen controllers, I kind of have a mixed bag of emotions. And no, I'm not talking about the Switch's Pro Controller. That, my friends, is way up here in S tier. No, I'm talking about the Switch's universal controlling devices, the Joy-Cons. I have a handful of thoughts about these things, and I don't know if I have more joy or more cons with these controllers. So, uh, no more wasting time. Let's, uh, let's talk about them. All right, I just want to get this out of the way and say I don't hate the Joy-Cons. I don't think they're great, but I don't think they're the worst thing in the world either. Let's start off by talking about the joy that comes from the Joy-Cons. From a design standpoint, I don't think this could be any more perfect for a console handheld hybrid. The way the Joy-Cons slide on and off the Switch or the grip is so silky smooth and seamless. And on top of that, the Switch click is one of the most therapeutic, gratifying things on this planet. It literally shoots satisfaction straight to my soul. It's fantastic. With the control not being directly attached to the handheld console, it really relieves the stress of having controller mount functions. I struggled with this back in the Nintendo DS days. For some reason, both my DS and 3DS's triggers broke. Apparently, Mario Kart was just too stressful or something, but for whatever reason, they did. And I'm uh, kind of traumatized from that experience, if you couldn't tell. It just makes the consoles literally unplayable. So with that in mind, you know that's one of the first things I noticed when the Switch debuted back in 2017. If something did malfunction, like say, I don't know, maybe the joystick, for example, it would be easily replaceable. Huh, isn't that convenient? If you happen to go down the replacement route, there's lots of different options when it comes to the colors. I really like the bright neon look of most pairs, and I think it's really cool that you can switch it up and mix and match different colors together and give your Switch its own little personal flair. From a design standpoint, I think these things are really well thought out for the most part. They're very simple, super convenient with their sliding and attaching functions, and I can't deny how versatile these controllers can be and the amount of different playstyles they offer. However, when we start to look at the Joy-Cons from a controller point of view, let's just say my feelings start to, uh, drift a bit. Like I mentioned earlier, these things have a handful of styles to play with, so I thought I would take a look at each one, starting with, of course, the Joy-Cons themselves. Just a disclaimer, these are all just my opinions, so uh, don't get your panties in a bundle if you disagree. Opinions may vary for others. With all that being said, I'm not the biggest fan of the Joy-Cons. Okay, I don't think I would have as much of a problem with them if it wasn't for their size and overall build quality. It just feels so cheap, and what makes it even worse is they're the complete opposite of that. 
The buttons feel a bit too small for my liking. The triggers are thin, and compared to most modern controllers, they don't really give off the best feedback. And the joysticks, well, where do I even begin? This is the worst part of the controller, in my opinion. They're small, they're stiff, they're stubby, and did I mention they're small? It's not even just the joysticks themselves, but even the rotation feels surprisingly little too. Whenever I use these, I always feel like I have a little more room to move around, but then it just abruptly stops. It's like I hit a brick wall. It kind of just adds unnecessary tension to the sticks that could have been avoided if they gave them just a little more room to work with. The tips of each stick could have been just a bit bigger as well. I don't think it would have hurt them at all if they extended the overall radius of the sticks themselves. I just feel like I can never get a comfortable grip with my thumb, and with them being the size that they are, I find that my thumb keeps slipping off them from time to time, and that becomes especially apparent if you're planning to sweat in games like Smash or even Splatoon. Overall, I think my complaints just boil down to the controllers just being a bit too small for my hands. They're uh, pretty uncomfortable, but I also can't gloss over the general quality of the controllers. Whenever I use these, they just scream cheap to me. I just think a lot of aspects weren't designed the best. But I will say they're functional to a degree, and are they my preferred controllers? No, not even in the slightest. Did they get the job done? Uh, yeah, <laughs> kind of. Stiff joysticks and small buttons weren't the only things they put in these guys. For starters, they brought back the N64C buttons. Great. The right stick has a dual function of being an NFC reader for all your amiibo, but considering the amount of compatibility they're getting from Nintendo games nowadays, I don't even know if I've ever used this. Also on the right Joy-Con is the Motion IR camera located on the bottom. It's basically a camera that can detect heat waves and turn them into digital signals. It's the same technology they used for the Wii Remote's pointer functionality. But serious question, did anyone else remember this existing? I mean, this camera really puts the IR in irrelevant, cause I don't think anybody cares. This feature is so stinking underutilized, there's only like three things that have used it, and one of them is literally cardboard. Okay, yeah, it might be a little underutilized, but in all honesty, what would they even use it for? I just feel like it's in such an awkward place to warrant any use. At the end of the day, it's just one of those classic cases of Nintendo creating a special feature for one single thing and never touching it again. Speaking of underutilized features, <laughs> let's talk about HD Rumble. Oh, HD Rumble. You know, the feature Nintendo couldn't stop praising during the Switch's first presentation and was basically used for one to two Switch games, or should I say, one to Switch the game? It was basically meant to make the Rumble function in your controller more immersive when it comes to the feeling of certain actions, but I'll be honest, with this feature, I've never really noticed a difference in any games. It could just be that I'm not paying attention to it while I play, but the only game that has really shown off the feature has been the line launch title, 1-2-Switch, and I've never played 1-2-Switch. All I remember from this game was the weird advertising it brought to the world. I mean, this dude looks like he's having a little too much fun. It looked interesting for the novelty alone, but from what I've heard, 1-2-Switch should be worth one or two dollars and not 50. It's literally just a tech demo of HD Rumble, and I think we can all agree this should have just been a pack and title for the Switch and nothing else. Aside from that though, I haven't really heard or experienced anything significant from HD Rumble. It's kind of disappointing considering Nintendo heavily hyped it up in the Switch's presentation and seeing it for the first time, I really thought it was a cool idea and had potential for things like VR and such. But again, I just feel like this feature has fallen off for the most part and to me, it wasn't as revolutionary as Nintendo was hyping it up to be. Yeah, so basically what I've come to realize is some of the features the Joy-Cons offer are about as useless as my 25 copies of Jonas Brothers on DS. They might find a use someday, but as of right now, they're, uh, they're completely useless. Let's shift gears and talk about one of the more prominent features on the Joy-Cons, the gyro controls. Now this... This is something I can get behind. Now, let me make it very clear, I'm not the biggest advocate for motion controls. The less flailing, the better. But when it comes to the Joy-Cons, this just makes sense. The gyro functionality itself is genuinely pretty good. From what I've experienced, it's pretty accurate to your movements. Using it for steering in Mario Kart or aiming in Splatoon or other shooters is fine, but where I think the gyro control starts getting some flack is when it tries to replicate the Wiimote pointer functionality. 
Now, personally, I don't really mind this control scheme. I grew up playing the Wii with the Wii Remote and Nunchuck, so to me, it feels pretty natural. The only issue it really has is with games that require pointer controls like the Wii. The cursor can get desynced from your Joy-Con's positioning, and often you'll have to recalibrate it back to where it needs to be. This is because the Joy-Cons are only simulating a pointer functionality, and not actually using an IR camera sending and receiving system. The Joy-Cons are essentially blind to the TV and are only basing their actions off your movement alone. There's no consistent receiver or reference on where the Joy-Cons need to be at all times, making it very easy for your cursor to desync even with the slightest movements. Like for example when playing Mario Galaxy and 3D All-Stars when you shake the Joy-Con to spin jump. Because of the sporadic movement you make, the gyro sensor can kind of get lost on where it's at and can very easily cause desync to the Starbit cursor. But even with this issue though, it's not like it takes forever to correct it, it's literally just one button press and boom it's recalibrated. But when playing a game like Galaxy when you're constantly spin jumping, I can see where recalibrating can get real tedious real fast. But as for the gyro controls detecting the general rotation and movement of the Joy-Cons themselves, it works great. Games like Super Mario Party in their minigames or Skyward Sword HD in its sword combat where all they need to do is detect the orientation of the controller is where it really shines. When games aren't asking for laser pointing precision and are more focused on general movement, the motion controls look like a more successful feature in my eyes. However, I've heard of people having troubles with their Joy-Con's wireless antenna not connecting, causing their gyro controls to become jarring and a complete mess. But from my experience, I never had an issue with it. I tried both my latest Joy-Cons and old ones, and still no issue. It may just vary from setup to setup, but the fact that the antenna isn't very consistent is once again a whole other issue involving the overall build quality of these controllers. So in conclusion, the Joy-Con controller is a small mediocre waggling device that has lots of features that are either just completely useless or just heavily underutilized. I wish that was the end of it, but uh, no, it's not. There's still more to talk about, starting with this piece of plastic. The Joy-Con Grip. You take your controller, slide them in this piece of plastic, and bada bing bada boom, you got yourself a tangible controller. Overall, it's really not that bad. Most of my complaints about the buttons and joysticks carry over, but surprisingly, the grip makes them just a little more bearable. The Joy-Cons do feel a tad bit too close for my liking, but again, it gets the job done. I remember when they first came out, it took me a little bit to get used to the sort of square-shaped design, but nowadays, I don't really think anything of it. Flipping it over, we have a... <laughs> What is this? I don't think you'll be seeing very many people rocking the Joy-Con drip around their neck with their Sunday best, but I, uh, I respect the thought. I don't really see the reason for this, but who knows, maybe more people use it than I think. I could be very wrong. I just don't really see what's wrong with this. But I guess you do you. Anyways, the Joy-Con grip is pretty solid all around. Not much else to say about it, really. It's more than functional with most games on the system, and that's all you can really ask for. But want to see something I didn't ask for? Say hello to the single Joy-Con. It's, uh, it's a single Joy-Con, all right. Now, the main reason the left Joy-Con has C buttons instead of a D-pad is to accommodate for a split Joy-Con design. Taking the Joy-Cons and flipping them on their sides creates two separate, con well, controllers if that's what you want to call them. It makes complete sense on why they did this, but it's still kind of a bummer, mainly when trying to play retro games or platformers that favor D-pad controls. Was losing the D-pad worth it in the end? Absolutely not! Want to know how to increase carpal tunnel rates? Just start handing these out one by one. That graph will skyrocket. This is probably one of the most uncomfortable ways of control my hands have ever felt. You know a controller is bad when people use it more for a handicap rather than using it normally. This thing is so freaking small within five minutes of using it, your hand starts to cramp instantly. That becomes especially true when you're using the right Joy-Con. Specifically on the right Joy-Con, the joystick is more centered, making it uncomfortably close to the button inputs. Throw in the addition of tiny triggers on top and you got yourself a recipe looking like this. I mean, on the rare occasions, it can work with simpler games, but if you have any game that asks for controls beyond using the joystick and two buttons, good luck. 
Nintendo tried making these more bearable by making the wrist strap attachment add a little more size to the controller, and while it does make it a tad bigger and easier to push the triggers, that's not really saying much. And you also gotta be careful with these wrist straps. One wrong move with these, and things can go south real fast. 911, what's your emergency? Yeah, I think I might have a problem. Look, I get the convenience. I think it's a very clever one for two deal, but with more cheaper accessible alternatives for controllers nowadays, this is completely obsolete, and for good reason. I'm sure people appreciated this design back in 2017 when they were desperate for a second player for snipper clips, but if you don't have an alternate controller by now and this is all you got, I don't know what else to say, but I'm sorry. So now that we've talked about the control schemes, Mr. Average, the we wanna be an old painful, it's time we take a look at the way the Joy-Cons were truly designed to be used. And that, my friends, is in handheld mode. You take your Joy-Con, slide them on each side of the console, and now you have a portable gaming machine. To me, the Joy-Cons feel like they work best on the console itself. They most likely started designing the controller from the handheld position and just worked off that. It doesn't really feel that bad to me. Again, most issues carry over like the overall size of everything, but when adding the additional weight and screen between each one, something about it makes it a bit better. One thing I will say though, is that the general shape of the Switch does get a little uncomfortable after long sessions of playing. I think it would have been nice if the Joy-Cons had a better shape or a curve in the back or something to make it feel more like a typical controller. The whole back of the system is completely flat and I think that's the main reason for its awkwardness at times. Also, when it comes to using gyro in handheld mode, uh, no thank you. Handheld mode isn't terrible, but I do think there's some improvements that definitely need to happen in the future. In my opinion, it's not that bad, and if there's one way the Joy-Cons are actually viable, I think it's in handheld mode. There you have it, those are some of my opinions about each Joy-Con control scheme and what they offer. I've practically talked about the ins and outs of these things, but it's time I stop beating around the bush, address the elephant in the room. Talk about the one thing that makes the Joy-Cons the most unbearable to use. The one thing that's literally affecting thousands of consumers. The one thing that Nintendo refuses to address, pushes under the rug, and avoids at all costs. And that one thing is Joy-Con Drift. Joy-Con Drift is more than just a controller malfunction. It is a widespread issue across Nintendo's whole Switch user base. Multiple lawsuits filed, thousands of reported cases, repair shops being overwhelmed with product repairs. This is outright insane. Now, if you've been around the block, you've most likely experienced a joystick drifting issue before where your controller's joystick randomly sends inputs to your game without you even doing anything. It's a pretty common problem among the gaming community and one of the most infuriating ones at that. It's mainly caused by usage over time, but if your controller is actually built well, that process can take quite a while to get to. Unlike the Joy-Cons that have reports of drifting problems literally within a couple of months of use. It all started back in 2017 when the Switch launched, and since then, it's gotten so bad that multiple lawsuits have been filed towards Nintendo. Like, you know this situation is getting out of hand when parents and children are suing this million dollar company over these. Literally, these. A lot of the claims against Nintendo include false advertising or deceptive or fraudulent business practices, and seeing as how Nintendo has handled this whole situation, it's really giving them a sour reputation. Nintendo obviously sees this problem, but yet they continue to sell these defective products rather than just fixing or reworking the Joy-Cons themselves. They probably just want you to go back and buy more of them. For 70 bucks! Now they have gone on to say that the Joy-Cons included with the Switch OLED model have quote unquote improvements, but I can't confirm nor deny that's the case. I sure hope they do. The Joy-Con drift problem is one thing, but the way Nintendo has seemingly done little to nothing to resolve this worldwide issue is kind of baffling. They used to charge people for Joy-Con repairs, but seeing as though they received a lawsuit and loads of controllers being sent to them, they switched the price and offered the repairs for free. But to make matters even worse, they supposedly delegated all the repairs to a third-party company that got overwhelmed with the amount of controllers being sent to them, saying 
thousands of Joy-Cons were sent in for repair on a weekly basis. Again, controllers drifting is a common thing, but having thousands of Joy-Con controllers needed for repair is shocking. Just like Joy-Cons, this whole situation is drifting away further and further from a solution. Like, I get that joysticks wear over time, that makes sense, but it's a serious problem if consumers get worried about using their Joy-Cons because they're scared of getting Joy-Con drift. I've personally experienced Joy-Con drift and this just further proves my point of these controllers having terrible build quality from the beginning. The whole situation is so dumb. Not only are the Joy-Cons just not a good controller in my opinion, but they're also known for one of the biggest controversies the Nintendo Switch has ever experienced. The Nintendo Switch Joy-Cons are a lot of things. They're versatile, they're clever, but more notably, they're small, they're cheaply made, and they're crazy controversial. Piece of advice, just go buy a pro controller. You'll be doing yourself a disservice if you don't. But with all of that being said, thank you for watching. I hope it was entertaining at the very least. Uh, subscribing, liking, commenting is always appreciated. But again, thanks for watching and I'll uh, catch you guys later.